Good evening and welcome to our program. This series is focusing on This Is Your FBI. This Is Your FBI was a radio crime drama which aired in the United States on ABC from April 6, 1945 to January 30th, 1953 for a total of 409 shows. The show featured true cases from the FBI and was told from an FBI agent's viewpoint. FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover gave it his endorsement, calling it our show and calling it the finest dramatic program on the air. Generally, I do not include advisories. Given Hoover's polarizing nature, I will share this. Dramatized stories created for propaganda purposes are not history. They tell one biased side of the story, and in no way am I saying that these are reliable stories. I just believe them to be interesting when viewed through the scope of entertainment and weird history. Finally, I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. If you would like to listen to standalone media, we have included a link in the description. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Are you one of the 50 million Americans covered by Social Security? If so, have you any clear idea of your rights and benefits under Social Security? Well, there may be a pleasant surprise in store for you, for in a few minutes you will learn from our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, how easy it is to build Social Security into full security. <laughs> Tonight's FBI file, The Walkie-Talkie Stick-Ups. During six horrible years of war, millions of human beings were slaughtered. And today, countless other millions are homeless and starving all because the younger generations of two nations had been imbued with a savage contempt for the rights and property of others, had grown up in the belief that the way to get what you want was to steal it, and if necessary, use a gun. Today, the lives and rights and property of American citizens are being assaulted by the biggest army of criminals in the country's entire history. How old are they? More than one out of five is under 21 years of age, and the percentage is increasing. Last year, the largest number of arrests in all age groups was of boys and girls 17 years old. Boys more or less like those in tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Young Jack Chase, whose crippled leg had long since earned him the cruel nickname Gimpy, spent most of his time in his little workshop in the cellar of the Chase House in Cincinnati. And that's where he was that afternoon when his younger brother Freddie and Betty's running mate, Knuckles Butler, brought him a problem to solve for them. Can we come in, Jack? Huh? Oh, sure. Come ahead. Go ahead, Knuckles. Okay. Me and Knuckles want you to show us how to work something. Oh, what do you got? If you lay off what you're doing a minute, Gimpy, we'll show you. My name is Jack. Okay. Look these things over, will you, Jack? Hey. Walkie-talkie radio sets. That's right. Hey, they're brand new. Mm-hmm. And they got U.S. Army stamped on them, too. No kidding. Where did you and Knuckles get these, buddy? Well, we, we got My them My down... cousin just got home from the Army. He had them, and we borrowed them. Okay? Yeah, that's right, Jack. Uh, that's where we got them. I see. How do they work? Well, they have to be set at the same frequency first. Then what? Well, I'll show you. Let's see, we'll make it a 112 megacycles. We'll make the wavelength about two and a half meters. Hey, what does that mean, Jack? Well, uh, 
Oh, it would take too long to explain. You want to set this other two, don't you? Yeah. Let's see. There we are. I'll pull out the antenna like this. Mm -hmm. When you want to talk, what do you do? I'll flip the switch over this way. Well, what about when the other guy is talking? You flip it back. I get it. Now, how can we tell if these things are working? Well, uh, I'll go outside and see if we can make contact. Okay. Uh, leave your switch like it is till you hear me. Right. This looks like it's going to be real easy, Knuckles. Yeah. Do you talk now? He said, wait for him. I ain't going to do anything. This is Jack. Anything. Can you hear me talking, Knuckles? Over. Yeah, sure. I heard you swell. Let me say something, huh? Get away. Well, look, how am I going to help you out in that job Shut if up, you don't... Shut up, stupid. The switch is open. What job is that, Fred? Fred, do you hear me? He didn't say job. He said Joe. We're going to take these things out tonight and have some fun. I'm on the roof of the warehouse, you dope. And quit talking unless you got to warn me about something. Okay. Everything is still all clear down here. I found the door to the stairs that lead down inside. The nylons are supposed to be on the top floor, so it oughtn't to take me long. Just keep a watch out for the cops. I'm going down in now. I won't say another word unless I have to. Go ahead. Stopping there. Wait a second. No. No, it's going on by. Whew. Had me scared for a minute. Next time, stupid, don't holler unless it's real trouble. Now shut up. That'll be enough. Here. What? Don't move and you won't get hurt. Okay. I could have got you coming down the steps. I heard you ever since you got in the roof. Yeah? I just wanted to see how you were working. So now you know. Yeah. Pretty smart. Using walkie-talkies, eh? Now, wait a minute. Don't flip that switch so your pal can hear what's going on. I want to get him, too. Knuckles, how you doing? I don't answer him, but I tell you. Give me that thing. I'll handle the switch and tell you what to say. Hey, Knuckles. Something wrong? Answer me. All right, now. When I flip the switch, you tell him what I say for you to tell him. You get it? Sure. I got it. You get this, too! Knuckles, are you okay? Sure, kid. I'll get the nylons and be with you in a minute. <laughs> Some two hours later that night, in the office of Agent in Charge Revere of the Cincinnati field office of the FBI. I'm the night watchman down at the Medford Brothers warehouse, Mr. Revere. You seem to have taken quite a going over. Yeah, you had a pretty good knock in the head, I guess. What happened? Well, I've already reported the burglary to the police, but I thought you fellows might be interested, too. You say burglary? Yes, a couple of hours ago. Two kids pulled it. Kids, huh? There's an awful lot of them getting in trouble these days. Yeah. Now, I came to you, I remember reading in the paper this morning about that army stuff that was broken into down on the river docks last night. Oh, yes, yes. There were some binoculars and walkie-talkie radio sets stolen. And these kids tonight, Mr. Revere, used walkie-talkies. What? Huh? One of them was posted down the street for a lookout, while the other one come inside by the roof to steal some nylon. Let's see. I should have held on to the one kid I had instead of trying to get him to get the other one inside, too. That's when you got struck down? That's right. Did you get a look at his walkie-talkie set at all? Yes, it had U.S. Army stamped on it, Mr. You must have been able to get a pretty fair description of the boy, too. Yes, sir. I'd say he's about 17 or 18. Oh, and... just a minute. I want to get Special Agent Niles in on this. Yes, sir. And then we'll get to work and see if we can save a couple of youngsters from getting into even more serious trouble than they have tonight. Hey, 
Hey, hey, Jack. Oh, what is it, friend? Has Knuckles been here? No. Where is that guy? He's supposed to meet me here an hour ago. You're seeing quite a bit of him lately, aren't you? Yeah, why? Ah, he's not a good guy to hang around with. Now, wait a minute. Since when are you running my life? I'm just giving you some good advice. Well, save it. You know, he was arrested last month for breaking into a candy store over on Front Street. They didn't hang that job on him. He got off. Nevertheless, he was guilty. And you know it. All I know is he's the right guy, so lay off him. Look, Freddy, my only concern is that he doesn't get you into trouble. Stop preaching, will you? I can look out for myself. Revere speaking. This is Niles, Mr. Revere. Good, I'm glad you called in. But I haven't got any lead on those kids yet. Maybe I have. What? A woman just phoned. She'd read about the walkie-talkies being stolen. Yeah? Yeah, she saw a kid next door to her house yesterday afternoon using one. Uh Uh-uh. The boy has a crippled leg, so he couldn't have been the one who slugged the night watchman. But he could have been the one who played lookout. Mm, It's possible. Anyway, you better hop out and have a talk with the boy. Here's the name and address. Come in. Hello. Hello. Are you Jack Chase? Yeah, that's right. My name is Niles. I'm a special agent of the FBI. FBI? That's right. Well, what are you doing here? I'd like to ask you a few questions. Okay. What about? A walkie-talkie radio set. Huh? Do you have one around here? No, sir. Why? Why? A neighbor of yours said she saw you using one yesterday afternoon. Look, what's this all about? A robbery was committed last night by two boys. They used walkie-talkies. They believe they're the same ones that were stolen from an army warehouse. I don't know anything about them. I understand you have a brother. Yeah, that's right. Is he around? No, sir. But I'm sure he didn't have anything to do with it either. We, we were both home last night when that robbery was committed. I can prove it. How do you know you can? Because I... I didn't tell you what time the robbery happened. Well, I... I don't have to know the time. I see. Well, Jack, I guess that'll be all for now. Sorry I can't help you, mister. Maybe you will yet, one way or another. So long, son. Hey, what kept you, Knuckles? I had to wait around to see that guy downtown. Did he buy the nylons? Sure. How much? Fifty bucks. Fifty? But they're worth ten times that. You told me yourself. Look, we're just starting. Wait until we get a rep. Then we can write our own ticket. I took a lot of chances for a measly fifth. Save the beefs, will you? Is your brother in the cellar? I don't know. Let's go see. Why? I'd like to clip him for a couple of chisels. Come on. What do you need chisels for? How do you think we break into places? Ringing doorbells? Oh. Go ahead. Okay. Hi, Jack. I've been waiting for you, Freddy. Yeah? Yeah. And you too, Knuckles. What for? I had a visitor a little while ago. He was from the FBI. Huh? What did he want? I think you already know. What are you talking about? Those walkie-talkies. You didn't get them from your cousin, Knuckles. Sure I did. You're lying. They were stolen from the army. That ain't so. Shut up, Fred. They were used last night in a robbery at a warehouse. You too committed that robbery. You're crazy. Oh, no. The FBI tried to pin on me because somebody saw me trying out the walkie-talkies yesterday. What'd you tell them? Nothing. Yes. What do you mean by that? I'm going to give you both a chance first to go down to the FBI and tell them you did it. What do you want to do, see your own brother thrown in the clink? He'll only get in worse trouble hanging around with you. You gonna do as I say, Freddy? No. Okay. I gave you your chance. Wait a minute, Gimp. Yeah? Where do you think you're going? You won't confess, so I'm gonna do it for you. Oh, no, you ain't. Get out of my way. Are you kidding? Oh, hey. Hey, don't, Knuckles. Keep out of this. Oh, Knuckles. Shut up. Oh. 
That should keep him quiet. Let's get out of here. We will return in just a moment to tonight's case, which shows how your FBI helps provide national security. And now let's listen in on a conversation about social security between a man named Mike McNulty and his friend, the Equitable Society representative. Hey, what do you take me for? A big shot with a fancy salary? How can a man who earns $60 a week think of retiring at 65 with an income of $100 a month? Because you've got a good old uncle who's going to help you do just that, Mike. Uncle? I'm no rich uncle. My father's only brother died last year, and all he left was debts. No, Mike, the uncle I'm talking about is Uncle Sam. What you'll get from Uncle Sam's Social Security gives you a big head start towards that $100 a month when you're still young. And what do you think of that? Me, Mike McNulty, a gentleman of leisure at 65, thanks to my fine uncle and his fine Social Security. Yes, Mike, many Americans have never discovered how easy it is to build Social Security into full security through life insurance. Most people are amazed when they discover how little it costs. For instance, if you already own some life insurance, your equitable society man may be able to show you how only a few dollars extra per month will give your wife complete protection and assure you a comfortable retirement income through the equitable extended income plan. Remember, your Social Security benefits vary according to your age, salary, and family situation. Why not get the facts? Find out exactly what you're entitled to under Social Security. The government has prepared a special card that'll help you secure this information. To obtain one of these cards, get in touch with your Equitable Society representative or send your name and address on a postcard to the Equitable Society, care of this station. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, the walkie-talkie stick-up. In Europe, it was a lawless army of swaggering, arrogant young Nazi bullies who took what they wanted by force and savagely struck down even the helpless and defenseless who stood in their way. In America today, it is a lawless and rapidly growing army of swaggering, arrogant young bullies who are taking what they want by force. In Cincinnati that day, it was one such bully who struck down a crippled boy. And it was that boy's own brother who stood by and watched the beating. It was early in the evening of the same day that Special Agent Niles of the FBI opened the door to room 21 in a Cincinnati hospital. Hello, Jackie. What? Oh, hello. The nurse said I could come in. Okay. Okay. Thanks. How did you know I was here? I went to your house again a while ago to see you. What'd they tell you? That you told them it was a hit-and-run driver that knocked you down. Well, that's what it was. <laughs> Automobiles can mess up a fellow like you messed up, Jack, but I never knew one to reach out and punch their victim in the eye, too. What do you mean? You've got a beautiful shiner. Look, I got it just... Jack, where's your brother? I don't know. You mean he hasn't even been here to see you? Oh, yeah, Sure. Sure he was here. Well, then he must have come in and gone out by the window. Nobody in the hospital saw him. Nobody home knows where he is. Nobody at Knuckles' house knows where he is, either. Knuckles? That's the nickname of the boy who slugged the watchman last night, and your brother has a pal by that nickname. Your folks told me. Oh. Why did they beat you up? Who said they did? I could tell today that you'd guessed who committed that crime last night, so when you wouldn't talk, I left you alone. Now, look, mister. Then I... you went to Freddy and Knuckles and advised them to confess, and that's when they beat you up, isn't it? I'm not talking. Look, you're not sparing your folks or Freddy either, Jack. What do you mean? You're letting them in for a much bigger shock later on. You're only saving Freddy for that day when he kills somebody and gets sent to the electric chair. 
How do you feel about that, knowing that you could have prevented it? What do you want to know? Everything I've said is the truth, isn't it? Yes. Then where are they? I don't know. Honest, I don't. All right, but you can still help. Maybe you can tell me something about those walkie-talkies. Freddy. Yeah? Do me a favor, will you? What? Quit sneaking along the street like you're wearing a convict suit. I, I can't help it. Look, we got here to Louisville okay, didn't we? Yeah, but... And what... nobody knows we're here. But they'll keep looking, Knuckles. And when they get to Louisville, we'll be gone. Only guys that stop moving and stop using their heads get caught. Maybe so. I gotta get a hangout. And case out another job. I've got to raise some dough first. Come on. Where are we going? To find a hot shop. What for? I'm gonna hock these binoculars. That'll bring us 20, 25. Yeah, but what'll a guy think when he sees U.S. Army stamped on them? He'll know he's getting the best there is, that's all. Let's go. You send for me, Mr. Revere? Yes, that alert we put out on the walkie-talkies and binoculars last night has paid off. Yes? Yeah? I just got a call from the office in Louisville. What happened? Two kids answering the description of the ones we're after pawned some army binoculars there about an hour ago. Oh, then I guess I better start rolling. Spencer of the Louisville office will be waiting to give you a hand. Good. All I hope is the kids don't get rid of those walkie-talkies, too. What's up, Freddy? I got us a job all cased out for tonight. You look like you're getting ready to go somewhere. I was just waiting until you got back to tell you. Tell me what? I'm going back home. You're what? I made up my mind, Knuckles. I'm leaving. Oh. Now sit down. Look. Look, it won't do any good to act that way, Knuckles. Maybe I didn't hit you hard enough. No matter what you do, I'm quitting. You can't quit even if I let you. Why not? You're up to your ears now, same as I am. I don't care. I'm going back home and give myself up, and you ought to do the same, Knuckles. Not me. I'm just getting started, and when we finish this job, I'm heading west. No, no, I'm not helping you. Oh, yes, you are. <laughs> After tonight, I don't want you. I'll get somebody with some guts. But this job we do together. not going to pull in the thing tonight, Niles. We better wait it out, Spencer. Maybe they changed their frequency. According to the brother, they don't know that much about it. He had to set it for them. Well, our receiver is set at 112 megacycles, too. I wish it would pick up something. Of course, it's possible they might be doing a job without the walkie-talkies, but I... Wait a minute. Huh? Hello? Hello, Knuckles? This is it, Niles. Shh. Hello, Knuckles? Answer me. I told you not to talk tonight unless there was trouble... But you've been in there so long, I got worried. I'll be out in a minute. And with plenty, too. Where are you? Still across the street where you left me. Hey. <laughs> How is this for a laugh, Freddy? What? I'm getting our binoculars back, too. That does it, now. Yeah, step on it. <laughs> Hello. Hello, Freddy. What do you say, Knuckles? I'm starting out the back way now, the way I came in. All clear out front? Yeah. Everything's all clear, Knuckles. I'm afraid you're wrong, Freddy. Huh? Freddy, what's the matter? Who said that? Special agent of the FBI, Knuckles. Huh? I just picked up Freddy outside. Well, what is this? I'm a special agent, too, and you're both coming back to Cincinnati. How, how did you find us? When we get to Cincinnati, I'll let a certain cripple boy tell you all about it, son. Come on. 
Because of his youth and his sincere desire to go straight again, young Freddie Chase was released to his parents and put on his good behavior for a period of six months. The boy called Knuckles Butler, however, showed no spirit of repentance whatsoever, and he is now serving a term in a school of correction. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we bring you a timely message on the subject of juvenile delinquency from the director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Mr. J. Edgar Hoover. America's crime bill runs into billions annually. If it could be diverted, the standard of living of every family in the nation would be raised. Increasingly, our crime problem is becoming a youth problem. A generation of right living and right thinking could bring crime to a minimum. If all parents would devote only a little more time to their children, learning to know and understand them, influencing them by example, winning their confidences by companionship, and instilling in them a heartfelt respect for the rights of others and for constituted authority, they would be investing in their future happiness and security. It is not too late to capitalize upon the vacation theme, a time when many young people are not thoroughly occupied now that school is out. Your son or daughter, niece or nephew, grandson or granddaughter, brother or sister needs real companionship and understanding. Give them a chance by seeing to it that they have your company during their vacation and yours will be more meaningful by having them with you. In just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's colorful story from the files of your FBI. Once again, friends... Let me remind you that no matter how much you earn, you have a valuable asset in Social Security. And your Equitable Society representative will gladly show you how easy it is to build your Social Security into full security. He'll explain to you how Social Security and life insurance can work together for your complete protection. and will help you determine exactly where you stand under Social Security. No obligation, of course. Phone him tomorrow. Your Equitable Society representative is listed in your local phone book under the name Equitable. E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Sinister Witness. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The role of J. Edgar Hoover was impersonated. However, all other names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. Now, this is Carl Frank, speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Sinister Witness, on This Is Your FBI. 
This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. <laughs> This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Are you one of the 50 million Americans covered by Social Security? If so, have you any clear idea of your rights and benefits under Social Security? Well, there may be a pleasant surprise in store for you, for in a few minutes you'll learn from our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, how easy it is to build Social Security into full security. Tonight's FBI file, The Sinister Witness. Sometimes, as you listen to these programs taken from the files of your FBI, it may occur to you that the characters involved are from another world. Nothing could be further from the truth. Every hour of every day, you are living closer to crime than you think. For the best proof of that, consider tonight's case, a case involving a person who might be you. People who stay up late and partake too freely will wake up the next morning with a hangover. That is a medical fact. A hangover can happen to a professor, a fireman, or even, as in this story from the files of your FBI, to the president of a department store, one Mr. J.B. Lamar. Mrs. Lamar is just across the bed from her husband as he opens his eyes for the first time. Good morning, dear. Oh, no. Dear. What? Pull down the shades. Are you going to stay in bed? Shall I call the store? Huh? What time is it? About 10 o'clock. What day is it? Friday? Mm. Oh, Friday. I've got to go downtown. I've got two appointments. Would you like some coffee? Well, not right now, dear, but if you uh, see the back of my head anywhere, let me know. Oh, all right. Oh, I almost forgot. Happy anniversary. Same to you, dear. Do you suppose there's any more champagne in town? If there is, I can't blame it on us. Mm, they can't blame it on you if there's no scotch either. Why? Was I drinking scotch and champagne? Mm. Oh, why didn't you stop me? The first division couldn't have stopped you. Oh, never again. You know, dear, you shouldn't go driving when you're feeling the way you did. Driving? I drove the car last night? You did. Where'd I go? Don't you remember that no one could talk you out of driving the Masons home after the party? I drove the Masons home all the way over across the bridge? You did. I really drew a blank. I don't remember anything after about 10 o'clock. You did it all by yourself. Oh, no. Oh, I'll get it. Hello? Good morning. How do you feel this morning, Mr. Lamar? Frankly, sir, not very well. I wouldn't think so after last night. <clears throat> Who is this calling? I'm a man who can be either a very good friend of yours or a bad enemy. Who are you? What do you want? My name is Dixon. Martin Dixon. And I'm calling you from St. Louis. Hmm? I got some information that's pretty valuable to you. What kind of information? Information about last night. Now, are you interested? Yes. Go on. Let's understand each other before we go any further, Mr. Lamar. Yes, let's. My information is for sale. And if I don't choose to buy it? How would Mrs. Lamar look as a widow? How dare you? (laughs) 
Yes? Mr. Lamar? That's right. And the man who phoned you about an hour ago. Your... Martin Dixon. Remember? Look here, Dixon. What's your game? Uh, maybe I better come in. I think you'll want to hear what I have to sell. All right. Come into the living room. To the right there. I think maybe you better close that door, too, Mr. Lamont. What uh, is all of this, Mr. Dixon? Here. Yeah. Take a look at the front page. Uh, a story about the hit-and-run accident on the bridge. Hmm. Police today were searching for the driver of a car which struck down and killed 78-year-old... What is this? You don't have to act for me, Mr. Lamar. I was there. You were where? On the bridge when you hit that old man. What? I I'm... thought it might be something of a shock to you, Mr. Lamar, and I also thought you might not believe me. So I brought the proof. What proof? These pieces of glass are from your right front headlight, Mr. Lamar. Oh, good Lord, I had no idea. No, of course not. I could tell from the way you were driving that you were pretty well loaded. Uh, wait right here, Mr. Dixon, will you? Where are you going? I'm going upstairs and get dressed. And then? And I'm going to the police and tell them I did it. Wait a second. You were driving while intoxicated. You hit an old man and left the scene of the accident. And the old man died, so you committed manslaughter. And you want to go in and confess? What else can I do? Don't you still want to run for mayor? What's that got to do with this? You don't think you'd be elected after this, even if you didn't go to jail, do you? I guess you're right, but... Look, Mr. Lamar, I'm the only one who saw the accident. You are? Yep. Now I've got the only evidence that you had the accident. Would you be interested in buying some rare pieces of glass direct from Toledo, Ohio? I, uh, let me think. Okay, Mr. Lamar. I'm giving you till 8 o'clock tomorrow morning to think. And I have that $2,500 in cash. So long. <laughs> Across the Lira River in St. Louis a little earlier that same morning, agent in charge Ritchie of the FBI's field office had just returned to his desk when... Ritchie speaking. Police headquarters, Mr. Ritchie. Good morning. I'm afraid that we've got a fugitive case that belongs to you fellas. Oh? What kind? A hit-and-run driver. We'll take it, but why does it belong to us? Because the driver headed his car across the bridge and disappeared in Illinois. That's a flight to avoid prosecution. We're filing those charges. That's for us, then. Now tell me, what happened? Well, we haven't got too many details, but we'll send the only witness down to your office right away. Who is it? A scrub woman who cleans up at night in an office building. I see. She was on her way home last night when she saw a big black car crash into an old man crossing a street about a block away from her, and then head on across the bridge without stopping. What about the victim? His body is at the morgue. Then we'll talk to the witness and assume that you'll check the body for clues. Right. Hey, Marty. Where are you, baby? I got to... Oh. I didn't see you. Mmm, mmm. Don't you look nerve wracking Don't speak to me unless you got some money. Okay. How do you do, Marty? Let me see it. There you are, baby. 2,500 skins. Oh. Count them. Where'd we get all of these? Well, you know those four little pieces of glass I showed you? Well? Well, I'm selling them to a certain party for $2,500 a piece. $2,500 a piece? That's right. He's already bought one. He thinks he's going to get the rest Friday morning for only... One more $2,500. I don't get it. That's not important now. The important thing is... Now I'm going to get some clothes. I'll say you are. And after I finish selling those four pieces of glass, we're off, baby. We're off. Richie speaking. This is police headquarters again, Mr. Richie. What's up? I was just wondering whether you had any word on the hit-and-run case yet. Nothing of importance. I'm waiting for a report from the lab. Mind me being curious? Well, not at all. We found a few slivers of glass at the scene of the accident. Might be part of a headlight. 
Yeah, that's probably the part of the car that struck him. And the fender, too, we think. Oh? We found a smudge of auto paint on the clothes of the victim. The lab's trying to identify it now. Good. Good. If there's anything we can do to help, just let us know. Uh, hold it a second, please. Special Agent Dunn is just coming in from the lab now. Got something done? The glass is from a headlight, all right. What about the paint check? Well, it's an exact match of the formula of paint used on the 1941 model Buick. Uh-huh. Hello? Yeah? We'll give you the first alert, Sergeant. We want to check all garages for one that may have repaired the right headlight and front fender of a 1941 model black Buick sedan. Okay, we've gone to work. So long. Now, let's put out the same alert done to all police departments in Missouri and Illinois right away. Right. It's just me, Mr. Lamar, the glass dealer. Come in, please. Okay. This way, please. I hope you haven't gone to the trouble to think up any funny ideas, Mr. Lamar, because I ain't going to... Step in, please. Have a chair. Look here, Mr. Lamar. I said have a chair. Do I get the $2,500 or don't I? No, you don't. What? I confess I was prepared to pay you another $2,500 this morning. In the last few moments, I changed my mind. How come? How come? Well, it's like... Never mind what it's like, Mr. Lamar. Hand over that $2,500 or I go to the cops with those pieces of glass from your headlight. Understand? Well, perhaps I can hold your interest better in what I have to say with uh, this little instrument. Why, you... Put down that gun. They started to say I was prepared to pay you another $2,500 this morning. And I said put down that but gun. But I've decided instead to give this whole thing uh, a little run off my conscience. What do you mean? I simply mean that I'm going to call the police to come and get me. And get you, too, for blackmail. Why, you... There where you are. Listen, you can go crazy and tell the police to come and get you if you want to, but you're not going to call them while I'm here. Hello. Hello, operator. 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 Hello. Hello. Excuse it, operator. Somebody made a mistake. We'll return in just a moment to tonight's case, which shows how your FBI helps provide national security. Now let's listen in on a conversation about social security between a career girl named Audrey Andrews and a representative of the Equitable Society. Uh, Carl, you mean that my social security that costs me only a few cents every payday may be worth thousands of dollars to me later on? That's right, Audrey. Why, I never dreamed it amounted to anything like that. Well, that's the wonderful thing about social security. It gives you a big head start in the race for full security. It's the first time in the history of this country that women, earning salary like yours, have been in a position to look forward to real independence. Well, how do you mean? Well, thousands of career girls these days are reinforcing their social security with life insurance. Actually, it costs only a few dollars a month for a girl your age to get life insurance that will double her social security benefits. That's real financial independence. Well, Carl, you certainly have given me a new angle on Social Security. Yes, Audrey, many Americans don't realize what a wonderful asset they have in Social Security. They've never discovered how easy it is to build Social Security into full security through life insurance. If you already own some life insurance, your Equitable Society man may be able to show you how only a few dollars extra per month will assure you a comfortable retirement income through the Equitable Extended Income Plan. Your Social Security benefits vary according to your age, salary, and family situation. Why not get the facts? Find out exactly what you're entitled to under Social Security. The government has prepared a special card that will help you secure this information. To obtain one of these cards, get in touch with your Equitable Society representative or send your name and address on a postcard to the Equitable Society care of this station. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Sinister Witness. To 
repent of a wrong does not wholly exonerate the wrongdoer. And although in tonight's case, the man Lamar had repented of his conspiracy with the blackmailer, like most repentance, it came too late. It was some two hours after the blackmailer had struck down Lamar and escaped that Agent in Charge Ritchie and Special Agent Dodden of the FBI's St. Louis office, in answer to a call from police headquarters in Newtown, arrived at the bedside of Lamar and was listening to his confession. And so now I'm fully prepared, gentlemen, to pay the penalty for whatever I'm guilty of in connection with the death of that poor old man. You won't think it's very kind of me, Mr. Lamar, to say so at this point. No, I think I know what you're going to say. You're perfectly justified, sir. What the blackmailer did to me was no more than I deserved for dealing with him and trying to cover up my crime. Thank you. I'd rather have had you say it. I guess there's nothing more for me to say except that uh, sorry I bungled the job of holding on to the blackmailer for you. With your help, we may be able to catch you, Mr. Lamar. Right now, we want to examine your car. I am afraid the blackmailer has gotten away with the most conclusive evidence. The pieces of glass from your headlight? Yes, sir. We picked up a few slivers of glass at the scene of the accident ourselves. Oh? And we also have a specimen of fender paint taken from the clothing of the victim. I see. Our laboratory, Mr. Lamar, has identified it as a formula of paint used on the 1941 model Black Buick. Well, gentlemen, of course, that's exactly the model of Buick you will find outside in my garage. You realize, of course, Mr. Lamar, that you're under arrest and that it will be necessary to place you under guard. Yes, sir. But we shan't move you until the doctor says it's safe to do so. Thank you, sir. Come on, Don. Let's have a look at the car. Right. Well, now that I'm Miss Fashion Plate of 1946, Freddie. Yeah, Marty? And since we're headed for new and greener pastures... Well... You might tell me to whom I'm really indebted for my wardrobe. Oh, okay. There's a sucker named Lamar. Why didn't you introduce me to him, Freddie? Maybe I could have gotten it a lot easier. <laughs> what went wrong, anyway? How do you mean? Well, you were going to collect a total of 10000 bucks and you stopped at five. Oh, you get a bad case of conscience and pull the gun on me. He was going to call the cops. So, you... So I took his gun, slugged him, and took it on the lamb with the second $2,500. What I don't understand about it all is those uh, four pieces of glass. Those four pieces of glass, baby, came out of a headlight on our car. So what? I didn't tell you this. I smacked into an old man the other night and killed him. I had to get away fast, so I took off across the bridge. Yeah? And what do I see parked at the side of the road right off the bridge but another black Buick sedan? Just like ours. I don't get it. Well, I stopped and looked in. There was a guy asleep at the wheel. You could smell the liquor on his breath three feet from the car. Yeah, yeah, go on. So right there and then, Freddy gets the bright idea of pinning the accident on him. How? He smashed his headlight. If that had waked him, I'd have played drunk myself. But it didn't. No, nah, slept right through it. <laughs> then I took a pair of pliers and just dented his right front fender a little. <laughs> Freddie, you're a real genius. Ah, uh, nothing, baby, nothing. It was a pushover for it. Too bad, though. We could have used that other five grand. We're going to make that look like peanuts, baby. You still haven't told me how. We're headed for a fancy lake resort, sweetheart. And? And there'll be at least one guy with arthritis and a big bankroll who can't resist your charm. Does he have to have arthritis? Well, anyway, when I come busting in your suite in the middle of the Danger Line cocktail... I'll yell. How dare you, sir? This is my wife. $50,000, please. Why, Grandma, what big numbers you have. Now, now, take it easy, Mr. Lamar. But I just can't believe it, that I'm innocent. Oh, darling, isn't that wonderful? But I still can't understand. I did drive over that bridge, and I was under the influence of liquor. Well, that doesn't alter the fact that the specimen of paint taken from the victim's clothing doesn't match the paint on your right front fender. But I, I don't understand. Now, do the pieces of headlight glass we picked up match the glass in your headlight? Mr. Lamar, you had an accident at some time with that car, didn't you? 
Why, yes, I had a little traffic accident about six months ago and had both the fender and the light repaired, but how did you find out? Mr. Lamar, it's the job of the FBI to catch criminals. I know that, sir. But it's also our job to see that innocent people aren't convicted. Yes, but this man Dixon... There's some kind of a frame going on, Mr. Lamar. You say the man who came here told you his name was Martin Dixon? That's right. Well, I had a hunch. I figured that maybe he did what a lot of criminals do when they assume a name, just change the first name. So I brought a picture from the police files in St. Louis, Mr. Lamar. Yeah. Is that Dixon? Yes. Yes, it is. I thought it might be. His right name is Fred Dixon. Well, I expect that's for me. Hello? Richie, this is Don. We've got some kind of a break on Dixon, but I don't know where we go from here. What have you got? Well, I'm down at a second-hand car dealer at 4th and Grand. Mm -hmm. He's got Dixon's Buick. When did he get it? This morning. Dixon came in and sold it to him for cash. This is the nearest we've come to him yet. Yeah, it is, but I'm afraid it's a dead-end street down here. Nothing in the car? No, not a thing. He cleaned out the glove compartment, and he even lifted the front and rear seats to see that nothing was left underneath. How do you know that? The dealer told me. Dixon didn't drop any hint to the dealer of where he was going, did he? Nope. He just sold him the car, took the cash, and left. Mm-hmm. I hope you're cooler where you are than I am out here. <laughs> not much cooler. Say, speaking of being cool... How was Dixon dressed when he sold the car? In a sports jacket and flax. A brown tweed jacket and brown gabardine flax. Mm -hmm. Brown and white shoes and a brown neckerchief around the collar of his sports shirt. Why? Meet me at the office. I've got an idea. Uh, bourbon and water, please. Uh, beg pardon, miss. You someone using the stool? Oh, it's all yours. Thanks. What do you mean by coming in here? I was afraid to call you on the phone. Okay, it's all set. Arthritis and all. When? We're having champagne in my suite after dinner. What time? Oh, Tranga, darling, till 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock, okay. <laughs> Ah, it's a pretty good suite you have here, baby. I wish I could stick around and watch the fun. <laughs> you can have this bottle of vino with me. No, 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 no. Suppose your Mr. What's-his-name Gardner walks in on me. Oh, that would be embarrassing. But he won't be here for an hour yet. Okay, you got my business then on the vino. Pour me a glass. Oh, this is living, ain't it, honey? Baby, baby, not ain't. You can't catch men like Gardner with a net if you say ain't. Are you kidding? Gardner's not interested in my vocabulary. I know that. You gotta have class to get these rich guys. I got Gardner coming here in less than an hour, ain't I? I don't want to fight, baby. Now you're talking. Yeah. Yeah. Drink and be merry, for tomorrow we travel again. With Mr. Gardner's 50,000. You think it'll weigh us now? Hmm. Not if you don't give it to us in change. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Now... Let's get through with our signals again, huh? Just to make sure we're right. Okay. Now, when I pull this window shade down, that's a signal for you to come up here. Yeah. I'm to get Mr. Gardner sitting next to me, right here on the couch. Yeah. And you pop in, and you say... And then he says, what are you doing there with my wife, Mr. Gardner? Who are you? What do you mean by breaking into my suite this way? I'm going to call the manager. How much were you going to charge, Mr. Gardner, for the privilege of sitting on the couch with your wife, Fred? I said, who are you? We're special agents of the FBI. What do you want with me? Well, to start at the beginning, you wanted for the hit-and-run slaying of an old man named Wilson. I didn't do it. I want a lawyer. I didn't say you did it, Dixon. I merely said that you're wanted for that crime. Now, if you're innocent of that, then maybe you can be convicted of blackmailing Mr. J.B. Lamar of St. Louis. Fred. Don't worry, baby. These guys are crazy if they think they can pin anything on me. No, we're not crazy, Dixon. You should have changed your clothes after you sold your car. When the dealer gave us a description of your clothes, I took your picture down to the airline ticket counters and to the railroad. But we didn't... When go... I got no response at those places, I went to all of the drive-it-yourself automobile agencies. Oh. When I hit the third one, they told me you'd rented a car there. How'd you know we'd come to this place? That was simple. One of you kind people did us the favor of leaving a folder on the counter. An advertising folder describing the charms of this lovely hotel. You did that, you genius.
For the hit-and-run killing of Joseph Wilson and for his crime of extortion, Frederick Dixon is now serving concurrent terms in the federal penitentiary. Mr. Lamar declined to press the blackmail charges, resulting in the release from custody of Martha Johnson. As Special Agent Ritchie pointed out, it is the job of your FBI to catch criminals and also to see to it that innocent people are not convicted. We repeat that credo of the FBI tonight because this is a day which all Americans might well mark. For this is July 26, 1946, a date which serves as a double anniversary. It was on July 26, 1908, that Charles J. Bonaparte, Attorney General in the cabinet of President Theodore Roosevelt, signed an order creating the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Nine years later, on July 26, 1917, a young law clerk joined the FBI, a young law clerk named J. Edgar Hoover. Since that time, your FBI has become nationally and internationally famous as an organization which protects you, the American people. Your FBI hopes to maintain that same reputation in the future by continuing to work for you as it works now, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. In just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's colorful story from the files of your FBI. Once again, friends, let me remind you that no matter how much you earn, you have a valuable asset in Social Security. And your Equitable Society representative will gladly show you how easy it is to build your Social Security into full security. He'll explain to you how Social Security and life insurance can work together for your complete protection and will help you determine exactly where you stand under Social Security. No obligation, of course. Phone him tomorrow. Your Equitable Society representative is listed in your local phone book under the name Equitable. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The case of the would-be movie star. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight's broadcast was directed by William M. Sweets, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. Now this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States presents This is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Are you one of the 50 million Americans covered by Social Security? If so, have you any clear idea of your rights and benefits under Social Security? Well, there may be a pleasant surprise in store for you, for in a few minutes, you'll learn from our sponsor the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, how easy it is to build 
social security into full security. Tonight's FBI file, The Would-Be Movie Star. As a general rule, statistics are rather dull. But here are some statistics which, to you and to every other good American citizen, should not only be far from dull, but should, in fact, be truly alarming. Last year in this country, major crimes alone were committed at the rate of nearly 5,000 every 24 hours. And the figures for this year already show an increase of almost 22%. And the figures are still climbing, particularly in that field of crime of which tonight's case from the files of your FBI is a recent example, the crime of robbery, which has increased during the last six months, almost 50%. Ever since she saw that movie a couple of weeks ago in which a baby stole the picture from the grown-ups in the cast, Ruth Patterson has been obsessed with three ideas. One, that her own two-month-old Ricky is three times cuter. Two, could have played the part ten times better. And that she and her husband Frank should move to Hollywood and get the baby into pictures. But thus far, they're still living in North Philadelphia. Where at the moment, little Ricky is... Well, roughly translated, that means bring me my supper bottle. Okay, okay, Ricky. I'm hurrying as fast as I can. Here. Here, take this bottle. Take it. Oh, that's it. Oh, gee, how you carry on. Oh, well, if you're going to be a movie star, I suppose you have to be a little temperamental. Just a minute. Now, just keep working on that bottle, honey. All right, all right, I'm coming. Hiya, sis. Oh, hello, Flo. Is uh, Frank home yet? No, he works overtime Monday. Come on in. Okay. <laughs> oh, gosh, excuse me. He don't hold a bottle so good. Okay, Mommy's back now. There we are. Uh. <laughs> Flo? Yeah? Come here. Well, what is it? Look at Ricky. Look at that face of his. Did you ever see such expression? Yeah, that's cute. Cute? With eyes like Jimmy Stewart, hair like Van Johnson, and a chin like Cary Grant, and all you can say is cute? Honey, I'm just happy he doesn't look like that husband of yours. Oh, gee, that reminds me. You know, you shouldn't even be here, Flo. Why not? Frank says he don't like for you to visit me. He thinks you're a bad influence. Haven't you given up caring what he thinks? Well, sure, but he's the only husband I've got. What about the Hollywood deal? Oh, you mean with Ricky? Yeah. Is Frank going to take you out there? No. He says that's out. And you still want to go? Of course. Without Frank? Sure, but, but How? I think I've got an angle for you on that. Oh, gee, what is it? Your car's here, ain't it? Yeah, why? Get Ricky. We're all going to the store. Store? What store? There's a supermarket over on the other side of town. What are we going there for? Get Ricky like I tell you and let's go. This kid is going to co-star in a little act that'll get you and him to Hollywood. What? Pick him up, will you, and come on. Okay, here we are. Ah, oh, look, Flo. Ricky went to sleep in my arms coming over. That's well. Bring him and come on. Where? Into that store. Oh, 
But look, it's already closed. Don't you see the sign on the door? The manager's still in there. He'll let us in. Oh, okay. I'll do all the talking. Come on. I still don't see what coming here has got to do with going to Hollywood. Just follow me. The manager sees us, but he's shaking his head no. Hold the kid up where he can see him. Oh, you mean like this? Yeah. Come on to the door, mister. Oh, here he comes now. Look, let me do the talking. Oh, I wouldn't know what to say anyway. I'm sorry, ladies, but the store is closed. Yes, we know, and we wouldn't have bothered you except on account of the baby. You see, it's my sister's baby, and she forgot You don't to... have to tell me. You forgot to get milk for the baby, right? <laughs> Now, how did you know that? Lady, I unlock this door two or three times a week for the same reason. <laughs> oh, then you don't mind? Of course not. Come right in. <laughs> Thanks. Go ahead, sis. Okay. We can't turn down little fellas that need milk. No. Now, if you just wait right here, I'll go back to the ice Never box. mind, mister. I beg your pardon? Never mind the milk. This is a stick-up. What? Whoa. Shut up. Well, I didn't know we came over here for this. Quiet, will you? Get him up, mister, and walk over to that cash register. You, 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 you're really holding him up? Do what I tell you, mister. Okay. Anybody in the back? Everybody else is gone. Okay. Over to the cash register. Here. Put the money in this paper sack. Fill that money bag, too. Hmm. Too bad I didn't think of this Saturday. We'd have got a bigger take. It'll be too bad for you ever thought of it at all. Oh, now, mister, don't be sore. This is as big a surprise to me as it is to you. Now, wait a minute, mister. Take your hand out from under that counter. I just wanted to get Drop some... that gun. Oh, no, I don't... Flo, you shouldn't have fired that gun. Look, you made Ricky cry. <laughs> A few hours later, in the Philadelphia office of the FBI, agent in charge Marlin is studying some reports when... Marlin speaking. Police headquarters, Mr. Marlin. Here's one hot off the griddle for you fellas. Yes, what is it? A supermarket in North Philadelphia was stuck up right after closing time tonight by two women with a baby. Two women with a... That's right, a baby, and they escaped with $5,300 after shooting down the manager. Is he dead? No, he'll be all right. We got him in a hospital. I don't see any FBI angle. Well, the car the women used was reported crossing over the New Jersey line at top speed about 30 minutes ago. Oh, I see. Well, under the National Stolen Property Act, that becomes our problem. Anybody get the license number? No, but it's a black Ford sedan, about a 41 model. Any description of the women? Well, the manager of the store gave a fair description. He's in the city hospital, and he's well enough to talk. Good enough. I'll send Special Agent Corey out there right away. Pour me another cup of coffee, Ruth, please. Oh, but you haven't got time, Frankie. Look at the clock. Hmm? Oh, well, fix me a cup anyway while I get on my coat and tie, huh? Oh, you better not stop for any more coffee, Frankie. You'll be late. Look, what's the matter with you this morning? Nothing, nothing's the matter. Why? You've been trying to rush me out of here ever since I got up. Oh, I am not. It's just your imagination. No, I'll answer it. Oh, no, I'll, I'll, I'll answer it. Uh, you go put on your tie. Okay. Please. Hello? Hello, sis. Has the jerk gone to work yet? Oh, um, good morning, Aunt Martha. How are you? What? Oh, oh, I get it. Look, this will only take a minute. Yeah, um, yeah, Ricky's just fine. Now listen to me. As soon as Frank is gone, get yours and the kids' stuff packed. Oh, I see. Why? Uh, why is that, Aunt Martha? I'll be over to pick you up in about an hour, so you'll be ready. Yeah, but I... I'm I... trying to tell you. I've got it all fixed. We're leaving for California today. See you in about an hour. Oh, swell. Uh, well, I'm uh, glad you called, Aunt Martha. Uh, goodbye now. So long. That was Aunt Martha, Frankie. What did she do? Change her mind and come back? What? Aunt Martha left for Florida two days ago, Ruth. But you must be mistaken. That was your sister Florence, wasn't it? Well... Yes, but I I didn't want you to get upset. She was here at the apartment yesterday, wasn't she? 
What? You should have emptied her cork-tipped cigarette butts out of the ashtray, Ruth. Okay. She she was here, but I didn't Look, want... Look, for the last time, Ruth, I'm telling you to keep that sister of yours out of this house. Oh, but Frankie... She's no I... good and you know it. Now, if you don't stop seeing her, first thing you know, she'll... She'll be getting you mixed up in something like this thing in this morning's paper. What thing? Two women. One of them with a baby stuck up a supermarket last night. But, but, but I, I didn't read about... Uh... Look it over. You'll see what I mean. So long, honey. So long. You keep away from that Florence. <laughs> Corey. Morning, Mr. Marlin. I had to go out on another case last night. Didn't get back. What happened on your supermarket investigation? You haven't seen my report yet? Oh, I just got in a few minutes ago. Oh. Well, I got one lead, and we ought to know any minute now whether it's a good one or not. What's that? The baby's footprint. Baby's footprint? Yeah. <laughs> I don't see how when you... When the got... women came in to hold up the store, the baby was asleep in its mother's arms. Yes? The pistol shot wakened it, and the baby started crying and kicking. Uh-huh. The manager remembered hearing the mother tell the baby to stop pushing his feet against a glass case. Oh, and that's where you found the footprint. Right. Good, good. I hope so. Anyway, I got the lab to turn out a lot of copies of it last night, and by now every hospital in Philadelphia has one. Well, what makes you think the baby was born in the Philadelphia hospital? The police said the hijacker's car was seen speeding across the line into New Jersey last night. That could have been a trick to give a false lead. They could have jumped, doubled back later, you know. Yes, I suppose so. If that baby was born in a Philadelphia hospital, we ought to know any minute now who its parents are. Just a minute. Oh, come in, Flo. Aren't you ready to go yet? Well, I couldn't start packing till after Frankie had left, could I? Oh, okay, but hurry. We've got to be moving. Flo, the newspaper had a story all about it this morning. Well, so what? They think we're over in Jersey somewhere. Yes, Don't Frank... stand there. Finish packing that suitcase. Oh, okay. Did the jerk suspect anything? Well, he knew that you called a while ago. What'd you tell him? Nothing. That's a switch. What do you mean? Look, slam that bag shut and let's get out of here. Where's the kid's stuff? Oh, it's already in the suitcase. Well, then shut it. Oh, all right. Okay, now come on. Got to meet somebody way over on the other... <gasps> Frankie. I found this on the floor of the car. Thought I'd better come back. What is it? A money bag with G&L Grocery Company's name on it. Well, what about it? I think your sister here can answer that. I don't know what you're talking about. There was a story in the paper this morning about two women and a kid. They held up the store that this money bag came from. So? I got a pretty good idea. You did the job and you took my wife and kid with you. Frankie, I... Honey, you know I'm telling the oh, truth. Oh, stop, will you? She probably hooked you in with some of that Hollywood talk, putting Ricky in pictures. Oh, Frankie, I don't I... want to hear any more of this. Come on, sis. Wait a minute. Ruth. What are you doing with those bags? Well, what she I... should have done a year ago. She's leaving you. Oh, no. No, she's staying. Both of you are. We are not. I'm taking Ricky to Hollywood and you can't stop me. Now, look, you may be tired of me, Ruth, but you're not going anywhere with this sister of yours until I get the truth on this stick-up. You, uh, really want the truth? Yeah. Okay, sucker. Oh. Hello. That was Ricky's 10 o'clock bottle. <laughs> return in just a moment to tonight's case, which shows how your FBI helps provide national security. Now let's listen in on a conversation about social security between a baseball fan named Jim Meyer and his friend, the Equitable Society representative. Well, now, um, let's see. You ask, who has a better chance of scoring a run? A man on second base or a batter with two strikes against him? Right. Why, the man on second, of course. That's right, Jim. And that illustrates a point about Social Security. In the old days, most of us had two strikes against us. Our chances of ever getting full security were slim. 
But now every man who has Social Security starts on second base. But how does he advance to the home plate, Carl? Through life insurance, Jim. Life insurance is the pinch hitter that never fails. For instance, at your age, by paying a comparatively small sum every week, you can double the protection you get from Social Security. Say, now that's an interesting angle. It's what you might call teamwork between Social Security and life insurance. Yes, Jim, many Americans don't realize what a wonderful asset they have in Social Security. They've never discovered how easy it is to build Social Security into full security through life insurance. Most people are amazed when they discover how little it costs. For instance, if you already own some life insurance, your Equitable Society man may be able to show you how only a few dollars extra per month will give your family complete protection and assure you a comfortable retirement income through the Equitable Extended Income Plan. Remember, your Social Security benefits vary according to your age, salary, and family situation. Why not get the facts? Find out exactly what you're entitled to under Social Security. The government has prepared a special card that will help you secure this information. To obtain one of these cards, get in touch with your Equitable Society representative or send your name and address on a postcard to the Equitable Society care of this station. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now, back to the FBI file, the would-be movie star. Although the number of major crimes committed by men is far greater than that of those committed by women, the criminal mind itself has no gender. The instinct or the urge to cheat, to rob, to kill can be just as strong in women as in men. And the woman who holds a gun in her hand is just as cold and ruthless and vicious and deadly as her male counterpart, and just as consistent, too, in leaving that inevitable trace which leads to her downfall. It was barely 30 minutes after the girl Florence had struck down her sister's husband, Frank, and fled from the apartment with her sister and the baby, that agent in charge Marlin and Special Agent Corey of the FBI arrived at the apartment house in North Philadelphia. Well, this is the right house number anyway, Corey. I hope they still live here. Yeah. Yeah, here it is. Mr. and Mrs. Frank Patterson, 2E, second floor. Come on. Go ahead. Thanks. You know, there's only one thing I don't understand in this case. What's that? Well, the hospital file on the baby's footprints is correct, but according to the record, the baby's father's a bookkeeper. What of it? Well, he just doesn't sound like the kind of person who'd have a wife that goes in for hijacking. <laughs> you should have been with the Bureau long enough, Corey, not to be surprised at anything. <laughs> I know, but... Hold it. A, B, E ought to be back toward the rear. Come on. C, D. That's E on the left there. Hold it. Just a minute, mister. Huh? You Frank Patterson? Uh, yeah. We're special agents of the FBI. Oh. You know why we're here? Yeah, I guess I do. But I'm telling you, my wife is innocent. It was her sister that got her into it. She's made nothing but trouble ever now, since she got married. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Not so fast. But she's taken my wife and baby away with her. i, I got to catch up with them before... They'll they... do the catching, Patterson. Just tell us what happened. Well, I, I don't know all the details, but when I found that grocery company money bag on the floor of my car this morning on the way to work... Yes? Well, I knew who had done the robbery I read about, so... I came tearing back to the house and found her sister was here getting ready to take Ruth and the baby away with her. What did you do? I tried to put her out of the house, but she struck me with something I passed out. What's her name? Florence. Florence Bethel. She lives at 824 North Street, but I don't suppose they went there. Before. Corey. Yeah? Hop over to that address right away and see what you can find out. I'll be back at the office. Right. Hello. Hmm? What are we 
waiting on the corner for? Waiting for the old guy who's going to drive us to California. What old guy? Oh, the one I told you about. He had an ad in the paper that he was driving through and would share expenses. I called him this morning and made the deal. Well, why couldn't we go on the train? It's safer for us this way. Oh. How do, ladies? Oh, hi. Uh, I'm Mr. Chandler. Are you the ones who are waiting for me? Yeah. Yeah, we're the ones. Fine, fine. Say, that's a mighty young baby you got there to be making such a long trip. Oh, yes, sir. He's only two months old, but he's just the cutest. He's real tough. He can take it. Oh, I promise you he won't be any trouble to you. He couldn't be any trouble for me, young lady. I like babies. Oh, you do? Okay, then. Let's get started. Very well. I'll give you a hand with your bags, and then we'll all be off for good old California. What did you find out, Corey? The sister had already packed and left her rooming house. But I got a lead on where they're probably headed for. Yes, where? The landlady overheard Florence Bethel using the payphone in the hall this morning. Uh Uh-huh. The landlady heard her say, Are you the man who had the ad in the paper about driving to California? That's all she had a chance to hear. That's enough for us. Get all the newspapers for a week back and we'll start checking all the personal travel ads. Found one to California yet, Corey? Not yet. Several to Florida, one to Chicago, and two to Texas. I'm but... having the same kind of luck so far. It's just got to be at least one to California. I'm on the last list now, so... Wait. Wait a minute. Find one? Yes. Yes, give me the phone. What did they say? Chandler's our party, all right. That was his niece. What route did they take him to California? His niece didn't know, but look up the number of the American Motor Club. What? She heard Chandler call the club to have them lay out a route for him. Good. Okay, here's the route they're taking. Then let's hit the highway. Well, that's doing it the hard way, Corinne. What do you mean? They've got at least a three-hour lead on us. Yeah, but... Now, we know the route they're taking and how much mileage Chandler plans to make each day. So after we put out a general police alert for them, let's pick out a plane stop somewhere on the route up ahead of them and... Young ladies are tired of listening to the radio. I'll be glad to turn it off. Oh, no, sir. We love it, don't we, Flo? Uh, yeah, sure. How's that baby doing? Oh, he's just fine, thank you. He's been sleeping for two hours now. Uh, and his second day of travel, too. <laughs> yes. He's really taking it in his stride, all right. When do we hit Nashville? We ought to be there in another hour, miss. Hungry? Little. We interrupt our program of dance music to bring you a special news bulletin. Seven states alerted by the FBI have as yet found no trace of the automobile believed headed for California, carrying as passengers the two women and a baby who figured in the holdup three days ago of a supermarket in Philadelphia. No, shut Police up. are confident that the driver of the car, A.B. Chandler of Philadelphia, what? is not aware That's of the identity me. of his passengers. And what? they express the fear that... Well, it, it looks like I've gotten a little better acquainted with you young ladies. Flo, what are we going to do? We're going to California, of course. Yes, Mr. Please. Chandler, pull off to the side and stop. What? What do you mean? We're leaving you here. Oh, no, you're not. I'm driving on into Nashville and turn you That's over. That's a gun sticking in your back, mister. Now stop like I tell you. You understand? Very well. Now get out. Flo, look. What? What? That, that car. It's coming right over the side. It's... All right, put down that gun, uh, miss. Who are you? A special agent of the FBI. The FBI? Thank heavens. That's right, and your trip to California stops right here. <laughs> oh, look, Ricky heard that. Now he knows he'll never get in pictures. For the holdup of the grocery store and the shooting of the manager... Lawrence Bethel is now serving a long term in a penitentiary. State and federal officials, convinced that there was no deliberate complicity on her part in either act, released the mother of the child, Ruth Patterson. Lawrence Bethel was just one more of the hundreds of criminals being brought every day to inevitable justice. But still, the crime wave in America rises higher and higher. 
Your FBI and your local law enforcement agencies can only capture criminals. They cannot prevent them from coming into being. That is a problem for America's homes and schools and churches and other social groups to solve. That is a problem on whose solution rests the internal security and future of America. In just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's colorful story from the files of your FBI. Once again, friends, let me remind you that no matter how much you earn, you have a valuable asset in Social Security. And your Equitable Society representative will gladly show you how easy it is to build your Social Security into full security. He'll explain to you how Social Security and life insurance can work together for your complete protection and will help you determine exactly where you stand under Social Security. No obligation, of course. Phone him tomorrow. Your Equitable Society representative is listed in your local phone book under the name Equitable, E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Lady of Larceny. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. Now, this is Carl Frank, speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Lady of Larceny, on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.